In this video and subsequent videos, we're going to look at market failures. That is, in a perfectly competitive market, it sometimes doesn't work perfectly. These market failures are when we are not allocatively efficient. We are not using our scarce resources to produce what society wants the most. So we're actually going to make a list here of the different market failures, the problem they create, and the solution. So we're going to come back to this page uh, throughout this video and the next couple of videos. So in a previous video, we looked at the idea of public goods. Public goods are non-rival and non-excludable. So if I enjoy it, it doesn't reduce your ability to enjoy it. And it's non-excludable. That is, it's hard to keep the non-payers out. So this creates a problem called the free rider problem. The idea here is that if we can't keep the non-payers out, then the quantity that's set by supply and demand, it reflects just the people who are willing to pay. And so this quantity is not the optimal quantity. In fact, what we have is underproduction. The quantity is less than the optimal amount. Because there's lots of people who are enjoying these public goods, but the quantity produced is based only on those willing to pay. So the quantity is not that social optimal amount. So what's the solution? The solution is to pay for it with taxes. So when we look at uh, national defense, when we look at roads, and um, when we look at um, like the street lights, these things, it's hard to exclude other people. I mean, with roads, we could have tolls on every road, but that doesn't quite make sense. So since it's difficult to exclude the non-payer, we make sure everybody who enjoys the benefits have paid for it. So that's public goods. The second market failure we talked about in previous videos was that of common goods. Common goods are things that are rival. So if I enjoy it, there's one less available for everyone else, but they are also non-excludable. It's hard to keep the non-payers out. And since one person using it up means there's less available for others, there's a tendency for us all to go and just grab as much as we can. So this is the tragedy of the commons. And when we think about fish and wild game, without regulations, this leads to overconsumption. We take as much as we can until it's all gone. So what's the solution to the tragedy of the commons? Well, we can have licenses, right? You have to have a fishing or hunting license. We can have quotas. So you're only allowed to have so many or have it at a certain time of year. Uh, we have, you know, fish and game departments within the government. So someone to keep an eye on the consumption or use. So these are ways to deal with the market failure created by common goods. Again, you'll notice that the solutions are why we are not a perfectly competitive economy, why we're a bit command, because they all involve government involvement to help address these market failures. Well, the next market failure we're going to look at is the idea of negative externalities. And then the fourth one we're going to look at, I'll just add them here and we'll go and come back, is positive externalities. So let's dive into what we mean by each of these and then we'll look at solutions. So an externality is when someone who is not the buyer or the seller is impacted. So when we look at demand and supply, demand is the customer. Supply is the business. The price and quantity sold are based on the value to the customer and the cost to the business. It does not consider the impact on everyone else. So sometimes people benefit 
from the production or consumption of a good or service. And sometimes people are hurt by the production or consumption. If these people are not the buyers or the sellers, this is an externality. So negative externalities, we also call external costs. Positive externalities, we also call external benefits. So both of them create market failures because the quantity in the market is not the optimal amount. If other people are benefiting, we'd like that quantity to be higher. If other people are hurt, we'd like this quantity set by the market to be lower. Okay, so we need to look at what are some examples of positive and negative externalities and then how do we resolve this market failure? So examples of negative externalities. If you live next to an airport and every time a plane takes off, all of your uh, picture frames on your walls turn sideways, you are being impacted by that noise pollution. If you live downstream from a pulp mill uh, that is uh, making paper, there's a lot of chemicals involved in turning um, ground up wood into paper, so that can create water pollution. Secondhand smoke. Uh, maybe you have uh, a neighbor who just has a really, um, their yard is cluttered, it's full of broken down equipment and cars, right? That has a negative impact on the value of your house. That's aesthetic pollution. So these are all examples of negative externalities. You're not the one flying the plane, you're not the one riding in the plane, but you're impacted. You're not the one selling the cigarettes, you're not the one smoking, but you're impacted. Now those are negative externalities. There are examples of positive externalities. So for example, if you are a farmer and there is a beekeeper nearby, you are not the one making the honey, you are not the one consuming the honey, but you benefit because the bees come over from uh, where they live to your farm and pollinate your crops. Okay, so there we have an external benefit. If you have a neighbor who does renovations to make their yard more attractive, okay, then that adds value to your home you are not the one selling the landscaping. You're not the one whose house was landscaped. But because it adds value to your house next door, you are benefiting. With education, what we see is that the more people who are educated in a town, the lower the crime rate, the lower the unemployment rate, the higher the standard of living. So as a town, we benefit when more people go to college or university. So there's a benefit to people who are not the one providing the education, not the one getting the education. So we have an external benefit or a positive externality. <clears throat> well, we said when we looked at both negative and positive externalities, the problem is, is the quantity set by the market is not the optimal amount. With negative externalities, the quantity set by the market is too high. If we're hurting people, we want there to be less. If we are benefiting people, then we want the quantity to be higher. So the current quantity is too low. We want the quantity to go up. Whereas with a negative externality, the current quantity is too high. We want the quantity to go down. We want to take into consideration the impact on the people who are not the buyers or the sellers. So let's dive deeper into negative externalities and then we'll do positive externalities. All right, so the problem with negative externalities is that they are overproduced. That quantity set by the market is too high. And that's because we said before, it takes into consideration the impact on the customer, that's demand, and the impact on the business, that's supply. Remember that supply curve came from the marginal cost curve. What we want is for the market 
to also consider the impact on the rest of society. This is what we call the marginal social cost curve, MSC. So the supply curve was based on marginal costs. That's the extra cost to the business. We want to have a marginal social cost curve. That's the extra cost to society, which means it includes the cost to the business plus the external cost. And the external cost is that per unit cost to everyone else, okay, to the rest of society. So let's look at an example of this and how we could get people to internalize that external cost. Because really we want the quantity to not be here, we want the quantity to be here. We want that quantity to go down because we wanted to take into consideration the impact not only on the business and the customer, but onto the rest of society as well. So let's look at an example. <clears throat> All right, so this article, it's a little on the old side, uh, but there's discussion about smoking bans in New York City back from 2010. And the reason I flag it now is because it has some interesting information about the external cost of smoking. And so we find in this article is that in New York in 2010, the price of a pack is $5.57. But when you take into consideration the negative externality, the impact of smoking on people who are not the smokers or those who are selling the cigarettes, the external cost is about $18.05. So where does this come from? Well, when you smoke, you're more likely to take smoke breaks during the day. So that has an impact on the productivity of your company, how much they're able to make uh, from your work. There's also an impact on the healthcare system because smokers are more likely to get lung cancer and other ailments. That means they're more likely to use the hospital system and require medical care. So the overall impact on the rest of society of a pack of smokes is about $18.05 per pack, okay? So if we were to truly internalize the full cost to society of a pack of smokes, we need to look at both the value to the customer, okay, the cost to make it, and the impact on the rest of society. So that would be the healthcare system, that would be the businesses who hire smokers, and so on. So that means that we would actually need to take that $15.57 and add to it the $18.05. So now we're looking at over $23 a pack. Well, why isn't the price of a pack of smokes $23? Well, we recognize that when the price of a pack of smokes goes up, less people are willing and able to buy. Now, it may not be a huge change in the amount that are willing and able to buy because that demand curve is steep. It's more inelastic, but there is some change. So you end up with a price that's higher than the $5.57, but not the full $18.05. So how do you get people to internalize that external cost? Well, to fully internalize the external cost of $18.05, we would have to create what is called an excise tax and make it equal to that external cost. So in this case, they would add a tax per unit of $18.05 to the $5.05 per pack. Now, as I said before, that doesn't mean that when you go and buy a pack of smokes, it's over $23 because what happens as you raise the price is less people are willing and able to buy, which is really what we want to achieve here. We want the quantity to go down. 
So one way to internalize the external cost is to create an excise tax equal to that external cost. An excise tax is not the same as a sales tax. A sales tax is a percentage. Sales tax are used to fund the operations of the government. Excise taxes are taxes paid per unit sold, fixed dollar amount, and it's a way to internalize that external cost. It does create tax revenue for the government, and that tax revenue is used to clean up the effects of the pollution or external cost. So in this case, if we added a excise tax of $18 to a pack of smokes, we could then use that money, $18, that would be 1805, times this quantity sold, a new lower quantity, to help pay for health care, uh, encourage businesses to find ways to be more productive so we can help cover that impact on the rest of society. So that means that on this graph, here this vertical difference is the amount of the excise tax or external cost. And here's our new quantity. So that means this rectangle right here is the amount of tax revenue, which is the excise tax, times that lower quantity sold. So this area here represents the tax revenue that the government would make from this tax, and that money would then be used to help uh, fix the negative impact on people who are not the buyers or the sellers. So just for interest, when we look at the excise tax we have on cigarettes here in Canada, how much of the external cost do we cover? Is our excise tax on cigarettes the full external cost? Well, if you are a smoker, you know that the taxes on cigarettes are quite high. What percentage of that external cost are we including? Well, this graph here shows you the percentage of that external cost <clears throat> that is being covered. And what we see here is that if you fully internalize the external cost, then your tax would be about 77% of the price. So that means that the ones that are here in red are fully internalizing the external cost. Now notice that we, in Canada, our tax on cigarettes is about 68% of the price. And so we are not fully internalizing that external cost. Now, there's been a proposal. Let's see if I can find this article here. Health Canada in 2017 called for a big tax hike on cigarettes. What they were trying to do is get that percentage up to 80%. What this would do is fully internalize that external cost. Let's go back to our graph and it would get smoking down to 5% of the population. So the idea with an excise tax is the quantity in the market is too high, it's hurting people who are not the buyers and the sellers, so we want that quantity to be lower. We add a tax per unit equal to the external cost, and that gets that quantity to go down and creates tax revenue used to help repair some of the damage that is done. <clears throat> so when we are looking at this excise tax, what we're trying to do is internalize that external cost. So instead of looking at the supply curve, we're looking at that marginal social cost curve. And the vertical difference here is the amount of the excise tax. And you'll notice here that our new equilibrium is over here. So what's happened is the quantity has gone down. 
And we can see that the tax revenue is the amount from here to here. It's the amount of the excise tax times that new lower quantity. So the question becomes, who pays the tax? When we add a tax to cigarettes, who is paying the tax? So if New York was to fully internalize that external cost of $18, so then does the customer, the one who buys the smokes, do they pay all of that $18? Who pays the tax? Well, when we look at the issue of who's paying the tax, we need to go back to some terms we've talked about previous to this semester. And that's the idea of consumer surplus and producer surplus. So you'll recall that consumer surplus is the difference between what the customer was willing to pay, represented by the demand curve, and what they actually pay. So you remember we found the area of a triangle to find that consumer surplus. So if we define consumer surplus, the difference between what the customer is willing to pay and what they actually pay. We have a similar definition for producer surplus. It's the difference between the cost to the business and the price they sell it for. So on the graph, remember the, mar the market supply curve comes from the marginal cost curve. So this is the cost to make it. Here's the price they sell it for. Producer surplus is the deal the business gets. The difference between what they'd be willing to sell for, so minimum, and what they actually sell for. Well, if we add to this graph the marginal social cost curve, and we identify that tax revenue, we can start to see who ends up paying for the tax. Now on this graph, you'll notice that when I add in that tax revenue, we see that it's coming half from the consumer surplus and half from the producer surplus. This is not always the case. The other thing we should flag is this space right here. Now, this space here was consumer surplus and it was producer surplus when this was the quantity sold. But when we added that excise tax equal to the external cost, we're no longer selling that quantity. In fact, we are now selling this new lower quantity which means this area that you see here in this blue triangle, all of this is lost consumer and producer surplus. We call this dead weight loss. These are the deals that the customer could have made, that the business could have made buying smokes at that lower price here and the higher quantity being sold. But because we've added this excise tax, it has made the smokes more expensive, which then puts some of the customers, they can't afford it, so less quantity is sold. So some of the deals the customer would have got, some of the deals the business would have got are now just gone because the price has gone up and so less quantity is sold. So that blue area is dead weight loss lost consumer and producer surplus. Now we said that it's not always that the tax revenue comes out equally of consumer and producer surplus. It's really going to depend on how steep the demand curve is and how steep the supply curve is. Now when we talk about the steepness of the demand curve, what are we talking about? We're talking about elasticity of demand. So if your demand curve is steep, is it more elastic or inelastic? 
A steep demand curve is inelastic. You change the price and the amount people are willing and able to buy doesn't change very much. A flatter demand curve is elastic. You change the price and the amount people are willing and able to buy changes a lot. So why would this matter in terms of who pays the tax? Well, let's think about cigarettes. Are cigarettes more elastic or inelastic? They are more inelastic, right? People are addicted, can't live without it. Non-smokers are unlikely to start. Smokers are, are not likely to quit. So demand is inelastic, a steep demand curve. You change the price, people are still likely to buy. Maybe not as much, but they're not going to change their quantity demanded a lot. Well, what if we then add the tax? If we add the tax and you're not very sensitive to price change, who's going to pay the tax? Well, when you have more inelastic demand, a steeper demand curve, when you add in that marginal social cost curve, notice this tax revenue here. Who ends up paying most of the tax? Notice that if your demand is inelastic, you have a steep demand curve, then the consumer pays most of the tax. If your customers have elastic demand, they are very sensitive to the price, you change the price and the amount they're willing and able to buy changes a lot, are you then able to pass on that tax, that increase in price that comes from the tax? You're not. So here we can see this tax revenue when it's inelastic is coming from the consumer. And we could just as easily draw a graph that is a lot more flat and show that when you add that marginal social cost curve, so let me just uh, add some here. So here was the consumer surplus, here's the producer surplus. Notice now, different color here, there we go. Notice now most of that's coming from the producer. So if your demand is inelastic, the business is going to pay more of the tax. If your demand is more inelastic, the consumer will pay more of the tax. There are other approaches to solving the issue. So let's go back to our... See if we can find our list here. So there are other approaches to solving our negative externality besides the excise tax. Oops. There are other approaches to solving that negative externality besides excise taxes, and we'll look at that in the next video.